So tell me about the show. Okay, we're going to have two wonderful women on. First one is Gayla Irwin from Louisville, Kentucky, and she's an artist. And the thing that's kind of different about her is that she just does self-portraits for the most part, and she's kind of dark. So my first question and kind of one of the things that I'm really interested in is why do you do that? You know, because for her to paint herself in such an unbecoming way is interesting to me. And she's getting ready to go to Rome. Yes, yes, and she studies all the time. And um, you know, she's studying in Greece and in Germany, and now she's off to Rome. She's going to study Caravaggio in Italy, and um, so, it, you know, she's just going to have a great time. And your second guest? Um, Charlotte Moss. She's an interior designer from New York City and wildly accomplished. She's written seven books, and she's designed for Stark Carpets and um, Brunswick and Fee, which these are really high-end companies. So she's, she's super elegant and feisty. You know, she has a strong personality. When I talk to her on the phone, I can just hear it in her voice. And you're going to travel to see her. Yes, we're going to Nashville. We're going to go meet her at the Nashville Antique and Garden Show. And we're going to go shop with her. Oh, how fun. Yeah. Welcome to Capturing Creativity, I'm Holly Greger. Creativity is a funny thing. It's as individual as a fingerprint. Do we all have it, or is it possessed by only a few? Today we're traveling to Louisville, Kentucky to talk to artist Gayla Irwin, where she is gonna show us where her commitment and courage led to her success. But first, we're off to Nashville, Tennessee to go shopping with interior designer Charlotte Moss at the Nashville Antique and Garden Show, where Charlotte is going to show us how being open and receptive to our creativity can take us even further. But first, we have to ask the question, why not? What were my first remembrances of decorating? I thought decorating was something that happened when your father went out of town. <laughs> Hi, Holly. I'm Charlotte Moss. Hi, How are Charlotte. you? Hi, Holly Gregor. <sighs> are Great. you ready to go shop? Oh, I'm always ready to go shopping. Okay, let's okay. go. All right. Charlotte, the first place we're going to stop is at a booth where they're from Alabama, and you purchased a planter, I believe. I did and I wanted to find out um, why you purchased it and what you're going to do with it. Why I do what I do, why I buy what I buy. <laughs> and I also learned that when Dad came home and he said, is that new? You were trained. No, Dad, that's been there. <laughs> okay, tell me, why did you buy also, that? It's more than a planter. Oh, it's champagne. It's flowers. It could be planted as well as just, you know, cut flowers. And there's something really wonderful about the scale of this. It's beautiful. Because I really see this sitting on a piece of furniture, whether it's on this, uh, like a sideboard, the way she has it displayed, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or in the center of a big long banqueting table, or coming in the entryway, greeting people. So sometimes it's serendipity that produces the best decorating. They, things find you. Now South is my home. I was born and raised in Richmond, Virginia. And that kind of leads me into your mother, because mm. during your speech today, you started with your mother. I started with my mother. And you know what? I think that's probably where all girls start. To, my mother, to me, was the original domestic diva. She gardened. She had a simple house, but she did it all herself. Mm -hmm. You know, she taught herself to do a lot of things that she couldn't afford to pay other people to do. She taught me how to do those things. I'm ready. This is Rebecca. Hi, Rebecca. I'm Holly Gregor. <laughs> what really drew me here was that there are things in here and shapes and the combination of stones and things that I've not seen before. Oh, my God. It's beautiful. Stunning. It is so unique. I know. It, I mean, 
It talked to me. You know how things talk to you. Exactly. <laughs> and it said, I'm yours. I'm yours. <laughs> Take so, me home. Just what I want to do is tell my husband, something else, talk to me <laughs> again. That was a big topic today in your speech. Sometimes you really have to make yourself step back, relax, take a deep breath to be receptive to what's around you. It was a garden that I just discovered, I discovered it some time ago, but it was the first time I visited it was last fall, was the Priory at Notre Dame d'Orsan, yes. which is down in Maisonnet, um, outside of Paris. Because I could sort of see what he started with and then what it is today. Um, and I think you have a different appreciation for things when you can see that someone actually did it from nothing. Yes. And, um, and that is, that's what gardening is all about. I mean, it is, it is that total organic, process and then you can see pictures of what worked and what didn't work mm -hmm. and that's what it is too it's about experimenting which is decorating yeah. but that's why uh, you use the word today serendipitous serendipity totally believe in it yes things do you have to be open for it though mm -hmm. you have to be open for it um, it's the best part because there's so many times where you have to go on the hunt for the perfect thing or the specific thing and you look and you look and you look and you can't find mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. And then there are times you just stumble upon something fabulous and you had no idea you were looking for it. You have no idea what you're going to do with it. And then you figure it out. Mazel tov. And how many of you have done show houses? Well, you know when you, you know, opening night, you know, you have to be there and everybody's all dolled up and people are coming through and looking at your room. And so I'm standing there that night, opening night. And, um, I remember what I had on. I had on a long dress that had feathers on it. And this woman came in and you know, sort of raised eyebrows and I thought, oh Lord, here we go. First she says to me, oh, feathers. <laughs> and I said to myself, brace yourself. She goes, what possessed you to put a bed in the middle of the room? And I thought, this, this is a woman on the attack. I said, why not? And I turned on my heels and started talking to someone else. I said, that was more bad karma than I wanted to entertain. So that is why every chapter in Charlotte Moss Decorates has a unit called, why not? Why the hell not? <laughs> when I see rooms that look too perfect, I'm suspect. Mm -hmm because they just look so stiff. And they really are more about the decorating than they are about the person. And they certainly are not about living. And I know that may sound very opinionated, but you did ask. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> My dad would have five kids in the driveway, in the station wagon, at the, at the end of his patients would say, Charlotte, and I'd, he didn't have to say, go get your mother anymore. I would get out of the car, because I was the oldest. I'd go in, mom, just a minute, just a minute. She's in there fluffing all the cushions, everything, straightening up the living room, and then she'd come out. And why was she doing that? Because, you know, she just wanted to know that when she walked back in, it was tidy, and who might come home with us? You know, like Elsie DeWolf said, a house will speak for your life. It's mm -hmm. a dead giveaway. Mm -hmm. Why not? Your house, as in this case mine, is your laboratory. It's your place to play. It's your place to experiment. It's yours. A young designer asked me this morning, Charlotte, how do I learn? What, what kind of recommendations would you give to someone who's new in the business? And I said, expose yourself to just about everything you can. Because if you go to those antique shows, you refine your eye by looking at things. You learn what pricing is. You see what dealers carry what. You watch to see how other people respond to things. You learn so much by observing. Look, in my first book, A Passion for Detail, one of the things I said was I learned more about decorating from my dad, who was a colonel in the army, because he told me one thing. Observe, observe, observe. Doesn't cost a dime. Empire style, so chic, so sleek. And what I love about Empire is that it's so modern, you know, mm, yes. for being what it is. 
That is all hand done. Oh, they'd be a stunning uh, uh, in a man's library, oh, uh, at a great card table mm -hmm. for a man, mm -hmm. um, be gorgeous down a long passageway with some Empire consoles, and I'm sure I could find some planters to go on those consoles. <laughs> <laughs> but the most important thing about decorating is not just that, it's this. The flowers you choose, the music you play, and the smile you have waiting. That's what makes for a happy house and good decorating. Do yourself a favor, I created this little mnemonic device to make, make it sort of idiot proof for myself. That was, um, do yourself a favor. F is fantasize, that's the first thing. And then analyze, which is your situation. Um, visualize how you want it to be. Organize everything you need to help you get there. And then realize, which is getting it done. Have one beautiful thing. You know, to me, one beautiful lily in a vase is as beautiful as a big, huge arrangement. Um, it's understanding that simplicity is beautiful and elegant. Charlotte, why is it important that everything be beautiful? Why is it important that everything be beautiful? Well, why not? Interior designer Charlotte Moss is busier than ever and just as excited today as when she first started. The key to her success is her continued exposure to creativity. Gayla, you and I have been acquaintances for years, but um, when just the other day when I came into your house for the first time, I was really shocked. I had no idea that you were all this, and I can see that you're very interesting, very deep, and um, have had a big life. So you thought I was like a dumb blonde? No, I thought <laughs> I thought that you were soft-spoken, understated, because when you, in public, you're very, you are like that. And then um, when you see all this, so you have a, such an incredible artist world, or you live in such an artist world, and that was fascinating to me. The reason that I wanted you to show me this picture is because the other day, when we were coming back here to take a look at it, and you um, wanted to show me because a friend of yours did this, but, um, when I saw that it was of you, it kind of surprised me a little bit. And then I said that to you. And then do you remember what you said? Mm -mm. You said, well, of course it's a, it's a picture of me. It's always about me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Many of the paintings in this house um, feature me uh, by other artists. And this is no exception. Um, this painting was done by uh, Mary Newton, who is a friend and colleague of about 20 years duration. Well, I, I, I love Mary's freedom of expression. She puts her brush down and does things with are absolutely magical. It's that kind of freedom that I never have in my paintings. You know, I work and I work and I correct and I, you know, keep fooling with it till it's just a certain way. And she takes that brush and just puts down magic. Every artist and whatever they do, and even in their portraiture when they do take that on, is painting, are painting self-portraits. So that's, um, one thing that kind of relieves me a little bit of this sense of out of proportion narcissism. Right, right. <laughs> but not by much. <laughs> you expose yourself in all your art. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, most of your art is a self-portrait. Yes. So, and it's obvious when you look at them how exposed you are. Yes. But what I see is um, sadness, a lot of whimsy because you always have your hair in some unusual kind of way. And then even with the blue makeup, um, you have no problem making yourself look kind of bad. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't understand that though. I, what, you know, why do you do the self-portraits and, mm -hmm. and what's behind all that? Okay. Um, why I do the self-portraits um, is because my work is very slow, very ponderous. Um, it's a snail's paste. 
And models this time, um, this year anyway, are going for $15 an hour. So I would go broke. So that leaves me, it takes a lot of pressure off myself because I know that I can never, I will never walk away. I'm always going to honor our appointment dates. <laughs> With you? Yes. Yes. This is Shane Hall, and he is an artist who works from uh, photographic uh, resources. So everything is uh, photographically derived. And this painting showed up in an exhibition of his at Chuck Swanson's a couple of years ago. Um, and I walked in and they were all political figure, figures, oh, wow. portraits, uh -huh. every single one. And I was hanging next to George Bush. <laughs> I didn't know what to think. Yeah. I see that as um, sort of the blink of an eye where I am inner, I'm looking inside myself. It's an inner vision. The moment before I put on my social face. Gayla, how would you describe your art? Okay, that's a really good question. I would, I would describe my work as being representational. Yes. Um, figurative. Um, it would be a self-portrait. You know, this is where I like to read reviews because of my work. And when people write about it, then I say, oh, wow, that's really interesting because I'm sort of the last person to know uh, what my work conveys. But I would say it's, um, it's, it's strong. Every painting will give you a sensation, a sense of its mood. But to look and stay with a painting is very, very important. And if you have the opportunity to look at a body of work over time, you'll see the same kinds of objects being used, which tells you something about how that person thinks or how they think of themselves in the world. So, and then the other thing you'll notice is that through time, self-portraits are almost always identifiable even when they don't know who the author of the painting is. We artists are um, mining this, this intense, deep inner self, which holds so much that most people can cover up. But if you're forced to spend hours in a room alone, all that comes up, even if you're not doing a self-portrait. So those areas of yourself that usually are off somewhere else or hidden behind closed doors, they do come up. You wow. are an art teacher at St. Francis High School, yeah. and you had mentioned that your students inspire you. Yes. And I made the comment that, well, I'm sure that the good ones do, but that's not how you see it. No, it's not. Um, what I really stress is that everyone is creative, and it's mostly the opportunity and the time and the focus that differentiates um, someone who's a hobbyist and someone who's an artist. Now what I love about my students is that um, they surprise me. And our, one of my students, several of my students are, are not what I would call art, artist material. Uh -huh. who are going to make careers out of it. I mean, most of them aren't. They're more interested in other subjects and thank, thank goodness because they'll actually be able to make a living at that. Right. Um, but occasionally they will surprise themselves and me with this burst of creativity that I do not know where it comes from. And what I see them do is so marvelous. And it makes me want to open my own self up. Right, almost like they teach you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, very much so. I saw a portrait the other day that you had done. You're starting a portrait. Mm -hmm. And I saw the portrait. I was a little bit surprised that I saw so much sadness. So is, do you always lean towards that? I would have to look back at the portraits I have done on commission, but I would say that that's probably a fair statement that I do project some of that. Um, however, I would, I would prefer to say that what I'm able to um, reach in my sitters is some true aspect of themselves. Mm -hmm. That relationship between the sitter and the artist is very intimate. It's not unlike being in a uh, closed room with your psychiatrist. Wow. Yeah. It is, uh, it is a, it's a give and take of listening, of being present, 
and, and you're willing to expose yourself. I think, I think that takes someone uh, very brave to do that. You know, I can't wait to expose myself. I do it any, take me to a party, get me a little drunk, and I'm always ready to expose myself. Okay, then that's what we're gonna do. Okay, I'm super. going to get you drunk. Okay, fabulous. And I've got beer in the fridge. <laughs> okay. Well, I think to be an artist these days, um, you have to be brave. Yeah. Jean, what did you think? I thought it was fabulous. The women are so strong and they, they're so clear in what they're trying to say to you and what they're expressing about their lives and also they, they express themselves so much, they just make themselves so available. What did you think you? about um, Charlotte and her personality? Charlotte, I, you know, I, I was afraid that Charlotte would be a little stiff, but she is fabulous. I would love to spend time with Charlotte yeah. or have her design my house. Fun. Isn't she a blast? She is fun and her stories about her father and you know, observe, observe, observe. It's fascinating. And she's fascinating. She's a great communicator. She is. She's very to the point. I mean, she's very easy to understand. She's very open and honest. Um, it would be, I, I envy you. I think that must have been fun to spend the day with her. You know, I think that both of these women are so open and that is what makes them fascinating is that they seem really comfortable with themselves and they're willing to just show you who they are. I like the fact that women are able to show their courage.